All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our women's Bible study. Uh, we are so glad you're joining us today. And once again, we are still meeting at our home because of the coronavirus. We can't get back to Rio Vista at the time. So I'm not exactly sure when we're gonna be able to do that again, but for the time being, we're still able to at least bring you content from our living room. So that's been kind of super fun. If you're new, uh, joining us for the first time online or however you found us, uh, welcome once again to our Bible study. If you want to know more about our ministry, go online to womensbiblestudy.com. Uh, there you can get handouts for today's lesson. You can get uh, past lessons, catch up on this particular series. Uh, we have lots of guest speakers, lots of uh, things that, that are on there that would, would benefit you. Uh, there's lots of different ways to watch us too. We always like to tell people this right up, up front. Uh, you can watch us on our YouTube channel. You can watch us on our Roku channel. You can download our Women's Bible Study app, which you can get on your Android, Apple, Windows. Uh, we do a lot of iTunes or podcasting through iTunes, Spotify, Google, lots of different ways to, to watch us and actually listen to us. Now, today is kind of a really super exciting day because for those of you that have been uh, working the series with us, today is our very last day in our parable series. I, it's, we've been working on the parables since August of 2019. So today we will have made it through actually 31 parables and we've added guest speakers in along the way to help us understand parables even more. So I just wanna real quick give you, uh, when we're done today, uh, we're going to uh, kind of move into our summer schedule. So I wanna tell you what that's gonna look like because we left for spring break. I always say this was the longest spring break we've ever had. We left for spring break, coronavirus hit, haven't been able to go back to Rio. Uh, and so by the time they actually let us in, it will probably be summer and we'll be on our summer break. But we, we will constantly be giving you content every week during the summer. So this is what our summer schedule looks like. For the next six weeks, like starting next week, we will be airing our exciting end times conference with Joel Richardson. Uh, you definitely do not want to miss that. So I just want you to know this, is, this was one of the greatest things that we've ever done. Uh, mostly because we're doing parables and we've been working through the end time parables. And so we knew that, we brought Joel in. And so he, his uh, conference will air one a week for, for the next six weeks. During that time, every Monday morning, you will get uh, an encouraging truth. We do. We started a new series, Encouraging Truth, um, to jumpstart your week. We want you to have something encouraging to hang on to for the week. So that will be every Monday morning, so you'll have content there. Um, what else? We just did our first live webinar with Joel Richardson. That turned out really awesome. We have an idea for a couple other ones throughout the summer. We'll let you know. We probably will be doing our Contending for the Faith conference as a webinar. And so if we do that, we will, uh, I'll give you a heads up on that. Uh, if you're not on our email list, uh, go to lisa at womensbiblestudy.com. Email me, I'll put you on our, our list. That way you'll know, you'll have kind of a heads up on what's going on. Our Contending for the Faith conference will be with Mike Winger. We will spend two sessions talking about uh, Jehovah Witnesses and, and why the Bible does not support the Jehovah Witness Church. We'll do two sessions on Mormonism, why the Bible does not support Mormonism, and we will do two sessions on Catholicism, on how the Catholic Church has veered away from the biblical gospel. So we will do that and I'll keep you informed on that. Then we will come back in August and we are going to start a brand new series in the middle of August and we're gonna call it, this makes me laugh, Been There, Done That. <laughs> and I started thinking about all the, the characters in the Bible and the lessons that we can learn on like faith and prayer and perseverance and anger and bitterness and what that does. And it's like, okay, they've already taught us all these things because they've been there and done that. And so we're gonna start a brand new series and we're gonna talk so you can understand the characters of the Bible and we can learn something from them. So that will come up in the middle of August. So. All right, I was trying to figure out how to end this series because it's been this long series and it, re I, it dawned on me one day, I was like, oh my gosh, Eric, when he videotaped from Israel, he made a blooper video on the very last day that we were there. So we're gonna start off with that and you can watch that and then we'll come back. 
All right, I can't even believe we finished. It has been 31 lessons for those of you that made it through all 31 lessons with us. We are so proud of you and so excited that you got to see the land of Israel, the land where Jesus walked and taught all of these incredible parables. Uh, it was a super fun trip. Uh, just an FYI, do not ever come to Israel in the summer. Uh, what we've been through is just, we started out you know, with a group of us. We were all excited and happy to be here. Uh, and then we went down south to like Masada and it is so unbelievable unbelievably hot. The humidity, it's miserable. We got a flat tire in Masada. How's that? So a lot of things happened while we were here. Uh, you would laugh. We got stopped at a border, uh, had to literally unload all of our suitcases, uh, have the whole van checked. That was super fun. What else fun happened? Oh, we were videotaping at the Sea of Galilee when a lady literally walks by us and takes off all of her clothes and jumps in the Sea of Galilee naked. That was fun. And what else happened here while we were here? Uh, airline tickets oh yeah yes. i'm a horrible travel agent they were supposed to fly out uh, like the day after tomorrow nope they're tomorrow so we pulled all these lessons together and we've been traveling all day long we're exhausted but it's super super fun so we wanted to show you how excited we are that this series is over ready one two three all right <laughs> Rob wanted me to make sure you knew that he and Eric did not see the naked woman that jumped into the Sea of Galilee, okay? Rob's back was turned to her. Eric was focused on the camera. Only Paula and I saw it. So anyway, he was like, Lisa, I don't want people to think I saw a naked woman. He did not, but we did, and it was kind of funny. Um, anyway, we'll finish out that blooper video towards the end, and, uh, and that's what we're going to do. So anyway, where have we been over the last 36 lessons? Um, what we did is Jesus tended to, to teach these parables in, maybe in, in sections, which is what we did. So we started off, you see this as the end, we started off with it saying the beginning. And in the beginning parables, Jesus was trying to explain to people like how to become a follower of his, like how to become a, a you know, he did the parable of the seeds, like how to be a good seed uh, planted in good soil that you would grow. And, and so Jesus taught a lot about how to get into this kingdom of God, which is, you know, being a child of God and representing him well on this earth. So we did the first section, then we went to the second session, se section, and we really did it so you wouldn't have to have the same backdrop for 36 weeks. Uh, instead of saying the end, it said the middle. And in these middle um, sections, it was, it was really, Jesus was trying to explain to people what it meant to truly follow him. What it was, you know, how awesome it was to, to, to be a, a, a Christian, like what, knowing Jesus meant. It was like having this, this very expensive pearl that you would sell anything for. So we spent a lot of time during, during that. Uh, Rob and I wrote, wrote a book uh, many years ago. Um, here it is right here. It's called Red Letters. And um, this middle section was kind of like what the back of the book talks about. I want to read the back of the book for you. It says, as we read the Bible, we are struck by the complete awesomeness of Jesus. His love, his compassion for the lost, his utter humility. He made the blind to see, he cast out demons, he hated worthless religion. He healed the sick, he walked on water, he forgave an adulterous woman. We're taken back by his love and concern he has for people. That seems to be like, almost like the first section of parables. But the second grouping of parables, this middle was this back of the, this portion of the back of the book. But then there's this other side, where his words and his actions are authoritative and sometimes startling. He took a whip and cleared out the temple. He told religious people they were going to hell. He made demands on our lives that we do not know if we can live up to. Love my enemy, pray for those who hurt me, take up my cross daily, love him more than any family member, be obedient to his word. These are difficult sayings that come directly from God. And see, that's what Jesus was, was pointing out to, to us in the, the middle section of the parables of what it really, the cost to follow Jesus. Now, just an FYI, that book, and I think we have six other books um, that we wrote, uh, Discouraged, Remind Me, things like that. Um, you can get those books for free, actually the PDF version of them. So we want you to know if you have nothing to do this summer and you want to read, you don't have to actually buy the book. You can go online to womensbiblestudy.com. Top right, it says free books, go there. You can actually download it and print it off and read it for free. So just so you know that. But what happens now is we've come to this, the end time parables, the end. And it was kind of like, 
Jesus, right before he went to the cross, seemed to talk a lot about the end times. Kind of like, what would happen after Jesus went to the cross? Uh, what would happen after he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven? What would happen at the end of the age when Jesus would return and come back and set up his kingdom on earth? Because the return of Jesus is what we are excited for and, and really pointing people to, because I think Jesus was pointing to it also. But, but what we want to talk about today is a parable that is kind of the other side of the coin to the excitement we have for the return of Jesus. And it's this word right here, judgment. Judgment. Judgment will come to those who have refused Jesus' offer for salvation. I learned this lesson of judgment on one of two of my most embarrassing moments I've ever had in my life. Now, uh, I, can, I can tell you the first one because this is a women's Bible study and most of you are women, so you'll totally get this. But I've, told, I've shared this with you before, but when I was in high school, we walked into my math class, there was a guy, we were walking in the door, he said, do you have a pencil I could borrow? I reached into my purse and instead my tampon had apparently fallen out of its little uh, plastic whatever. And I, I was so in a hurry, I reached in and I grabbed it and I handed it to him. So that was like, literally, if you were in high school, you can imagine how embarrassing that could possibly have been. Second most embarrassing moment was this. Our boys played Little League, and we were at one of their Little League games. Rob was their coach, but for some weird reason, he must have been out of town because there's no way I would have done what I'm about ready to tell you I did. For some reason at this game, the umpires didn't show up. And so because they didn't show up, the coaches and their assistant coaches would have to go out and umpire for, for the people, the opposite team. So because Rob wasn't there, I stood in, I had to be an umpire, and so did, did Rob's assistant coach. Now, whatever happened at first base, um, it was my call, whether he was safe or out. And so the guy on the other team, the kid, he, he hits the, you know, the ball, they, they throw it to first base, Clearly, the kid is safe. I have no idea why I did this. This is what I did. He's out! Everybody freaked out. The parents, I mean, it was like, what? I'm standing there, I'm so embarrassed, I don't even know what to do anymore. So thankfully, we had a really, really nice assistant coach on our team, and he walked up to me and he said this. He said, Lisa, whatever you say is what it is. You are the final judge of this call. Nobody can override you. So you just say what you think it is, and that's what it is. And so because I was super embarrassed, I just said, he's out, even though he probably was safe. It's one of those things that haunts me all of my life. <laughs> but it was just this reminder that whether it's football or baseball or, or soccer, that there's always someone who has the final, final judgment call on whatever someone else is doing. What we learn from today in our parable today is that there is going to be an end judgment. And God is going to be the one that will make that final judgment call on where you and I will spend eternity. But the great thing about God is that he gives us a whole lot of extra time to find him. Unlike me making that call, God's judgment will always be perfect. You get a lot of chances to come to Christ before then, but at some point, the minute you die, it's like over. There's a story about the Wild West, and there was a, a young boy who was in a stagecoach going from one town to the other. He had a belt on. For some reason, he was leaning out the window. He hit, they hit a bump. He sort of fell out. His, his, his belt got caught on something on the stagecoach, and the stagecoach was basically dragging him. He was very little, but there was a younger man who, who was riding his horse and saw this happening. So he comes running over on his horse, and he rescues and saves the little boy that had, was about ready to be dragged to death. Um, the thing is, is that as these two grow up, the little boy and the young man, the young man that helped him became a judge. The little boy 
ended up becoming a criminal. One day, the, the criminal ended up in the judge's court. And he realized that this is the guy who saved him on the stagecoach so many years ago. And so he pleaded with the judge. He said, you've saved me before. You can save me again. But he told the criminal before he said the words, you're guilty. He looked him straight in the eye and he said this. When I saved you on the stagecoach, I was your savior. But today, I'm your judge. See, Jesus is going to be both our savior and our judge. Because he sent his, he, he, God sent Jesus to this earth to take the punishment for our sins to, so, and to provide a solution so that we could spend eternity with us, to save us. But people on this earth that, res, that refuse that, that grace of God, then you know what? They will be judged for all eternity for their sin. For those of us who have placed our faith in, in Jesus, God will say, save them. For those of you who don't place your faith and trust in Jesus alone, God will say, out. That's just what the Bible says. So today we're going to talk about this last parable that Jesus even spoke of before he went to the cross. And it's all about this one particular final judgment, and it's called the sheep-goat judgment. But today I want to make an overarching lesson that isn't so much about the judgment, but it's about what people do with this set of verses. And, and so my, my theme for today is going to be this. We have to read the Bible in context. Because this is one of the most out of context taught verses in the Bible. And I don't know why I kept thinking, we could talk about the judgment and we're gonna do that and we're gonna, we're gonna talk about the sheep and the goat and what that means. But I think there's this overarching, we need to know the Bible so well that we can spot it when someone teaches us something that's not true. Um, the reason this became important to me is really because we've been doing this whole end times thing with pre-tribulation theory and all that. And, um, and we've been teaching, you know, with Joel and, and, and we've been just teaching this whole idea that the pre-tribulation rapture is not there. It's not in the Bible. And, and all the verses that people use are taken out of context. So when Joel Richardson was here and he made this really great point when we did our webinar, one of my questions was, uh, you know, how are people getting this so wrong? Like, like we, we read Matthew 24, the tribulation, like Jesus will not return and take us back with him until he says immediately after the tribulation of those days, Matthew 24, verse 29, sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light. And then Jesus will come back and gather his elect together. Like I said, it's right there. So what, what are people missing? And he said this, he said, people read that verse and they go, oh, Jesus just gave us a timeline. So they go to their pastor or their teacher and their pastor or teacher says this, oh, but it doesn't really mean that. And so what happens is people go, well, my pastor knows more than me. My teacher knows more than me. So I need to believe them instead of just me. And then we buy into that whole theory. I really want that to stop. My heart is desperate for that to stop. I want us to be in Acts, what they're called the Bereans. They search the scriptures daily for themselves. They would read the Bible face value. I always want you to pretend if you were on an island all by yourself, that's why we're doing our Contending for the Faith Conference, could you come up with a Jehovah Witness? Could you come up with Mormonism? Could you even come up with Catholicism? But even more than that, could you come up with a pre-tribulation rapture? And the answer is no. But we're so bent on just listening to, you know, people who we think are smarter than us. But you know, you're smart too. So you need, if you want to study prayer and someone told you, if you just have enough faith, you should believe. Well, you know what? You should get what you want because you just, you just have enough faith. That's not true. Now, there is a verse that says that. But the Bible says you need to, what does the whole Bible say? And, and so Google it. Every verse in the Bible that talks about prayer. And study it for yourself. Like, you might be surprised at what you learn when you do that. Um, 
But today is kind of an example of how the entire meaning of the parable is missed and is taken out of context. So we're going to start first. We're going to talk about, um, we're going to show you our video. We went to Israel, our last video. We went to Israel and we, um, we videotaped spots in Israel because we wanted you to see the land where Jesus taught these parables. But we also wanted to, um, to read the parable that we were going to be reading in class from a place in Israel. So watch this and then we'll continue on. Good morning, welcome to Israel as we are here in Nazareth Village. And I can't even believe we're saying this, but this is our very final lesson in our parable series, Life Changing Stories. And hopefully throughout this entire, entire parable series, it has changed your life because that's what parables are supposed to do because I know it's been changing mine. So today we're closing out our series at Nazareth Village. And today we're gonna be talking about sheep and goats. Because in reality, as, as what we live, especially in the United States, we, we realize that very few Christians understand that following Jesus isn't about going to church, isn't about a religion. It really is a way of life. And Jesus has told us what that looks like in the past 30 parables. Uh, we have been taught so many times in our culture that following Jesus is just something we do to maybe make us feel a little bit better or something to believe in in hopes that Jesus will just maybe make me a little healthier or make me a little wealthier or or someone just to pray to to in hopes that life will just be made easier or something to do just to keep us busy on Sundays and Wednesdays and I think that Jesus knew that and he knew that that thinking would infiltrate our lives and so these parables have been cutting to the core of what it means to be a true follower of Jesus and what we've been seeing is that being a true follower means this you got to love others. We have to care about others. That's the one thing that shows other people that we truly are followers of Christ. But it's kind of hard to grasp in the United States, especially when we come to people, we see people, we think, well, someone else will take care of them. It's, it's the church's job. It's the government's job. It's not really my job to take care of them. But it's so interesting that Jesus uses this end time parable to remind us as followers of Christ what matters to him most and that is people. And, and what matters to him is how we as his people treat his people. And this parable is going to make a huge final point to that. There was a song many, many years ago when I was younger. The words to the song were, and they will know we are Christians by our love. And, and a lot of times we don't see that going on in the church. We see a lot of fighting and arguing and bickering and all of that. But Jesus says the love that you showed other people will prove that you are really my follower. So the overarching uh, point to this parable today is about the end times. So we're going to pull the end times together with, with this whole idea of, of caring and loving for other people. And so we're putting up on the screen a timeline. Some of you are going to hate this today, so just get through it. You'll understand what I'm talking about. When we did the series on Revelation, the series was called The Clock is Ticking. We did this seven year period of, of the seven years of tribulation and, and we're putting it up on the screen so you can kind of see because there's three judgments coming that we're gonna talk about today. But if you look at the timeline, don't just, don't shut it off today because you're like, well, I just don't believe the rapture is then. You need to get over that. The bottom line today is not when is the rapture. The bottom line is that these specific judgments are gonna happen and we need to understand them because Jesus tells us about them in the, the parable today. Now, if you look on this particular um, timeline, you'll see towards the end, there's what is called a Bema judgment. And it's most likely a rewards ceremony. Uh, as followers of Christ, it, it probably happens after the church is raptured. Um, and what, we will, what it is, it's, we'll be rewarded in heaven for the things, the faithfulness and the things that you did on this earth. Uh, then you see on, your, um, on the timeline, there is a great white throne judgment. It's at the end of the thousand year millennial reign. Remember, Satan is bound during that thousand year reign. He's released and then he's thrown into the, the pit. It's a final judgment where the dead are judged. And you can read that in Revelation 20. Uh, this is this judgment that separates people for all eternity. But then it's the, really where there's this sheep and goat judgment that seems to happen right after that seven year period, tribulation period, right after that and before the thousand year reign. And the Bible says that all Jews are gonna be saved at this particular time. So it doesn't seem like that's who this is for. 
but there still are people on earth, Gentiles, non-Jews. These are people that made it through the final three and a half years or final three years of God's wrath on this earth. They probably gave their life to Christ. Uh, they would be considered the sheep. Some people made it through, but they never gave their life to Christ. Those would be the goats. So this judgment would be separating the sheep and the goats. And God made it clear how he knew the difference between the sheep and the goats. And look what he says in Matthew 25. And this will be our final parable. Verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food and I was thirsty and you gave me drink and I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked or clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in, naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And Jesus answered them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, you did it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So today, that's what we want to talk about. Not so much timelines, when these things will happen, but the overarching purpose of this is, our job is to love and take care of other people. And what happens is, we're not saved because we do those good things and love people and help them. But when we're saved, God changes us on the inside and it changes how we treat people. And that's how we know if we're truly saved. We'll talk about that in class today. Okay, so here's what's going on. Uh, at the end, and we showed it to you in, the, in there, but I wanna show it to you kind of up close here. Uh, at the end of, I'm gonna try to walk to the camera so you can see this, this better. Try to see if I can do this right. Um, what you need to know, know is at the end time, there's, there's three different kind of judgments. So once we are, once we are uh, raptured out of here, uh, we'll be, of course, gone. But at some point, not exactly sure when that point's going to be, there's what's called a Bema judgment right here. And what that judgment is, is it's kind of like a, a, an award ceremony, a reward ceremony for those people that are, are followers of Jesus, now they're in heaven, they'll be rewarded for what they did here on earth. So that, that's this judgment. Over here, after the reign of Christ for a thousand years, there will be this great white throne judgment where you know, the books are opened, um, all those that were in Hades, all the dead will be ris arise, and, uh, and then God will judge them on whether they will spend eternity in hell or whether they will spend eternity with him. So that's this final, final judgment. But in between there, there is this sheep and goat judgment. And, and the time period for that is, is the church is raptured, uh, the, the, the wrath of God is poured out on the earth, Jesus comes back at some point in here, um, he's going to be, you know, bringing the Jewish people back and, and, and leading the captives out, he'll set up his, his throne right at this particular time here, but right before we have this thousand year reign where people will go into um, this, this thousand years with Jesus, there is what is known as the sheep and goat judgment. And so we want to talk about that today because this is what people take out of context. Now, um, when, when a pastor wants to teach on you need to give and you need to help the poor and you need to you know, help other people, they pull this particular parable out of context and then they tell people this. So here it is, look at Matthew 25, 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared to you from the foundation of the world. Why? For I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. Now, that is what a pastor will 
use as an example. Now, here's how I know that is because I found two different sermons and the pastors diff, you know, use this particular passage to tell his congregation, you need to go out and help people. Now, I want to tell you the illustrations that they gave their congregation. The first one was a pastor and he said this, once there was a little boy and he wanted to meet God, and so he knew it was probably a long way away where he would find God. So he packed his suitcase. He packed his suitcase filled with Twinkies and cans of root beer. So he started walking. And as he walked along, he noticed a woman sitting in the park, an elderly woman just watching the pigeons. He went over to her. He opened his suitcase, sat down and said, would you like a Twinkie? He gave her a Twinkie and she just smiled. He loved her smile. So he said, do you want a root beer? So he gave her a root beer because she smiled even bigger. So all day long, they sat there watching pigeons, drinking root beer, and, um, and eating Twinkies. So before he left, he turned around to leave because he knew he had to go home. And as he was walking, he realized that he wanted to give this woman a hug. So he ran back, gave her a hug. She smiled because she hadn't gotten a hug from a little boy in a long time. But when he got home, his mother noticed how happy he was. So she said, what did you do today? And he said, I had lunch today with God. God is older than I imagined. Meanwhile, the older woman returned home and her son noticed that she was in very good spirits. And he said, what, what did you do today? And she said, I sat in the park and ate Twinkies with God. He's much younger than I expected. And then the pastor went on to say this, verse 35, when I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. Now, we should be doing those things. And I'll talk about that in a second. But in context of this, this, the verse and the passages that we're talking about today, that's not even what it's talking about. So we'll go there. But this is what I'm saying. We've got to look at things in context. Another pastor used this illustration. He said, many, many years ago, there's, there's a man who moved into a small town. The town was placed on a, you know, on a railroad track, uh, near a, a railroad track. Um, the new man that came to town, every morning he would see an elderly woman walking and, and picking up something off the railroad tracks. So he got curious, he went into the grocery store and he asked the grocer, he said, why does that woman pick up, what is she picking up from the train tracks? And the grocer said, oh, that's the widow Jacobs. And every day she comes clear across town to pick up coal that's spilled on the tracks when the early morning train comes through. The new resident looked at him and said, but there hasn't been a steam locomotive using coal, coal on these tracks for years. And the store owner said, that's right. But when the steam train stopped running, Mr. Simpson, who runs the hardware store, he was really concerned for the widow Jacobs, that she would no longer have coal to heat and cook with. He knew that she was too proud to take charity. So he decided that he would get up every morning and take a bag of coal and put it on the tracks so she could come pick it up and it would keep her warm through the winter and give her something where she could cook. In the sermon, this pastor said this, a few lumps of coal dropped along a railroad track. It's not much, but it's something. And I believe God calls each of us to do something to make someone's life better. And then he quotes the verse. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. The pastor went on to say this. It doesn't matter if you solve the problems of all the world. It doesn't matter if you do something big, but... The Bible calls us to do something for somebody. It's not much, but you can do, make a little difference in someone's life. Now, in both of those, those sermons that the pastors taught, the question is, is, are we supposed to help people? And the answer is absolutely. Like that is part of being a follower of Jesus. That's what we're called to do. As Christians, we're supposed to help the hurting. We're supposed to help prisoners and homeless and take people Twinkies and root beers and put coal on the tracks to help someone. Like we're called to do that. So please know that when I tell you what this, this section means, 
It doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing those because it does. It's part of our job, district, job description as a follower of Christ. But if we're going to study the Bible in context, then we need to make sure and see what the whole passage is even talking about. And remember, Jesus is telling us these end time parables. And he's talking about a time when he comes back to this earth. And this whole parable is about a sheep and a goat judgment. It, it's not for you and I today if we like don't feed the homeless or take Twinkies and, and rip. It, it has nothing to do with us, even though those are good things. But this particular passage isn't even about that. Even though there's these overarching mandates, biblical mandates of helping people. But in context, Jesus is talking about the end time. All right, so let's set up this parable. Now we talked about this earlier, that, that when we are raptured out of here, which is over here, I know it's really hard for you guys to see this, when we're raptured over here, then um, after the, the sixth seal, and, and what happens is it kind of initiates this day of the Lord, the, the trumpet and the bowl judgments where the, the world is gonna be completely turned upside down at that particular time. Uh, we see this in uh, Joel 1.15, it says, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, and it will come as destruction from the Almighty. So you have this time where the church is raptured, those that know Jesus is raptured, and then you'll have this judgment that's coming upon the earth. We studied that, of course, in Revelation. But I want to show you what happens right before, like, like the, the day of the Lord gets initiated, like the church is gone, right before this all starts, something happens. And it's really fascinating. Um, look at what happens in Revelation 7, verse 1. So church is raptured. Uh, the, 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 they're get, the God is getting ready for his, his judgment and destruction from God, the wrath of God that would be poured out onto this earth. Look what he says is this, verse 1. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Now, that's where we get this. Right before here, the, right, this, this initiates the day of the Lord, but, but right before all of this bad stuff starts happening on the earth, an angel shows up. And God says, whoa, 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 before you get ready to destroy the earth, he said, do this, verse 3, do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from who? From the tribes of Israel. And we're like, what? What does Israel have to do with any of this? But Israel has everything to do with this because in Genesis God made a covenant with them and, and there's this weird thing out there um, that, that uh, people say that, that God's done with Israel uh, and, and that, that the church has replaced Israel and it's called replacement theology it's not true it can't be true if it's true then that means God's a liar because God made a covenant with the, is, the, the Jewish nation all the way back in Genesis for the land, for, it's, his, he's, it's his chosen people. And God is not done with Israel ever. And, and honestly, after the, the rapture, I think these, these 144,000 will give their life to Jesus because the Bible says after Jesus comes back and they come face to face with Jesus, all Israel will be saved. So we know that anyone that's Jewish will become a follower of Jesus at that particular point. But look who they are. Verse 5, from the type of, tribe of Judah, 12,000. Reuben, 12,000. Gad, 12,000. Asher, 12,000. Now we're like, who are these people? Well, look at our map here. Remember when, Moses, uh, when Joshua brought the Israelites, you know, Moses, Egypt, Israelites came into the land of Israel. Um, Abraham has Isaac, Isaac has Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons. Those 12 sons each got a portion of this land. And so they've always, always been known as the 12 tribes of Israel. And what's interesting is that, that God knows, like after 70 AD, when uh, it, the Jerusalem was destroyed, 
all the records were destroyed. So like if you were Jewish today, you probably wouldn't know what tribe you come from because there's no really way of tracing that nowadays. But God knows. That's what's so amazing about God. It's like he knows. He knows if you're Jewish, what tribe you're from. And he has set aside 12,000 people from every single one of those tribes and preserved them over all of these years. And he's putting a seal on them. And he's going to protect them when God is going to wreak havoc on this earth. Now, here's what I want to remind you, that the return of Jesus, when Jesus comes back, I was always taught that, that, oh, Jesus is here, and he sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives, and that's that. But I don't think that's true. I think that what Joel says is right. He will come probably, he'll come back probably near Mount Sinai. He will w work his way down through Jordan. He will pick up this 144,000 because they are going to be a remnant and God will hide them. They will march their way up into Jerusalem where he will set up rain. But the cool part about God, Jesus coming back is this. He is coming back first as a warrior to fight the nations who have disregarded them to fight the nations who have disregarded his people, the Jewish people that you and I know of. Look at Zechariah 14, verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in the midst, for I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then look at this. The Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. Jesus is going and settling his accounts. This made me laugh. There was once an agnostic farmer who wrote to the editor of a local newspaper, who the editor was actually a Christian. The agnostic farmer said this, In defiance of your God, I plowed my fields on a Sunday. I, I disked and fertilized my fields on Sunday. I planted on Sunday. I cultivated on Sunday. I reaped on Sunday. And in October, I had the biggest crop I have ever had. How do you explain that? He asked his Christian editor. The Christian editor replied and said this, God does not always settle his accounts in October. <laughs> And that's what this is all about, God settling accounts. But with that background, that is what sets up this parable about the sheep and the goat judgment. So in context, what is this passage talking about, about feeding, you know, helping the, the sick and being kind to prisoners and, and feeding, what is that about? And so this judgment will be based on this. This is, how, this is who it's for. This is for who will be allowed into the millennial kingdom with Jesus. So all what we just read about helping people and all that, this is for this particular time period. This like seven year period of time, which now has probably been about three and a half, four and a half, five years, I don't know. It's based on how people during this period of time have treated the Jewish nation. Now, who's left on earth? Well, we know it's going to be the 144,000. God is protecting them. So we know we have those people that will be here. I'm assuming there's some people that never took the mark of the beast, uh, not because they were Christians, but just because they were stubborn. They're like, no one's going to tell me what to do. So that's a possibility. I would assume as soon as the, the people are raptured out of here, that there's going to be a lot of people coming to know Jesus at that time. Like, ah, we missed it. We got to get on board with this. And, and, I don't know how many people are going to be left because when you have the trumpet and, and bold jo judgments poured out on the earth, how many people are left? I don't know. I mean, look at the devastation here with just these two judgments, the trumpet judgments, hail, fire, blood, one third of the vegetation will be burned. A mountain will be thrown into the sea. One third of the sea becomes blood. Now think about that with the oceans. And then you have a star that falls into all the fresh water. It makes all the fresh water bitter and poisonous. The sun and the moon and the stars are dimmed. Um, there's a demonic invasion. There's one third of mankind that are killed in one third of mankind killed in war. And then there will be this great earthquake that shakes the earth. And that's just like the trumpet judgments. And then there's more with the bold judgments. 
the topography of the earth will completely change when, when it's all said and done. So I don't know who's going to be left. It's hard to even imagine. We know there will be, and we also, also know there will be nations left, like the United States maybe, Australia, South... I, I, it sounds like it is from this verse. Look at Matthew 25, 32. All the nations will be gathered before him. Now, the word nations is a word, it, it, it means it's called ethnos, and it's kind of like people group, Gentiles, non-Christians. Now, how all these nations will end up in front of Jesus in Jerusalem, I don't know how that's going to play out, but it says that he will. And it's during this time when all the nations are standing in front of him that this is when he says this, and he will separate from one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep's from his goats and he will say to the sheep on his right hand he will set the sheep on his right hand but the goats he puts on his left and this is when he talks about what what decides which group you're going to go in then the king will say to those on his right hand come you blessed of my father inherit the kingdom of God prepared for you from the foundations of the world it's like what I want to stop there for a second, and I want to talk about, real quick, inherit the kingdom of God prepared before the foundation of the world. Because before the foundation of the world, before Genesis ever even happened, God knew there would be this end time. There would be this thousand year reign of Jesus, where there, this end time where there'd be a new heaven and a new earth. Like, that's what we've been pushing toward. But because we know because of that that this was prepared from the foundation of the world the one thing we see is this the patience of god new england preacher philip brooks was known for his calmness and his poise his friends knew very seldom that he got frustrated and irritable but one day one of his friends saw dr brooks pacing back and forth just really frustrated his friend said Dr. Brooks, what, what are, what, what's bothering you today? And he said, well, here's what's bothering me. I'm in a hurry. I want to get this stuff done. But God isn't. God is not in a hurry. He's not in a hurry for this world to get over. He's waited 5,000 years for people to turn to him. He's waited over 5,000 years. He's had a plan all along. His plan is for how people will get to spend eternity with him forever and ever and ever. And it all is because of what we read in the Old Testament, this Jewish nation that God rose up from nothing, from one man named Abraham. And all through the Old Testament, we see this Jewish nation. We follow it until we see the birth of the Messiah. And then we see his death and we see his resurrection and we see this plan that has been building for thousands and thousands of years. And God continually is patient with this world. I sometimes look around and I go, the world is in such a mess. What is he waiting for? But here it is. He's giving people time to find him. Speaking of patience, a little boy was standing at the end of the escalator. Sales lady said, son, are you lost? He said, no, ma'am. I'm just patiently waiting for my chewing gum to come back. <laughs> there you go. There's patience for you, I guess. But the Bible tells us over and over and over again that there will be a day when the patience of God runs out and it's over. So for this people group on this earth, at this particular time, this is what this sheep and goat judgment is all about. Look at verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, the sheep, come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Why are they inheriting this? Look at this. For I was hungry and you gave me food. And I was thirsty and you gave me drink. And I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And then the sheep, the righteous ones on his right were like, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed you or thirsty or give you a drink? When did we see you a stranger or take you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or come to you? 
See, remember, Jesus is talking to this group of people at this particular time. And the king will answer and say, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So in context, this sheep and this goat judgment is all based on the nations or the people, that, that how they treated his people, his Jewish people, possibly even Christians at that particular time that are left on this earth. But it's really mostly about God's covenant and his promise to go all the way back to Abraham. And for the Jewish people, it's an exceptionally difficult time. The world is chaotic at this time. The wrath of God is being poured out. Satan and the Antichrist are enraged at the Jewish people. And it seems that Jesus is making a point to these, to this, these nations or these people groups in these nations that how you treated my people during this horrible tribulation period, that is the criteria for what would get them into the millennial kingdom. Look at verse 41. He now turns to the goats. And he will also say to those on the left, depart from me. You guys are out of here. Curse out. You're cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Why? For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not take me in. Naked and you did not visit me, or, or did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you didn't visit me. And they're looking around going, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And he says the same thing. He answers and said, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, his people, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So I was thinking about that, and it made me think about Corey Ten Boom. Corey Ten Boom, for those of you that know her or know her story, and she wrote a book called The Hiding Place. In 1837, she and her uh, sister and her father, they were very, very devout followers of Jesus. But they knew that the one way to show people the love of Christ was to help them. And so they had this open door policy for anyone in need. And it didn't matter. You know, sometimes we have this idea that, oh, I just need to help my Christian brothers and sisters. But I think Jesus says you need to help everyone. You need to help anyone in, in hopes that you would bring them to Christ. And so that's what the Ten Boom family did. They helped people, and uh, their home became a refuge for actual Jewish people being hunted by the Nazis. But by protecting the Jewish people, they risked their lives. But this was the way that they lived out their Christian faith. It was estimated that the Ten Boom family helped 800 Jews. But on February 28, 1944, the family was betrayed by the, and the secret Nazi police raided their home. Uh, they set a trap, the Nazi police did, and they seized everyone who was coming in and out of the Ten Boom home. By that evening, 30 people had been taken into custody, but there were Jews that had been hidden in a false wall in Corey's bedroom. They were saved, but Corey and her dad and her sister, Betsy, were hauled away. Corey's father was 84 years old. He died after only 10 days in Schwenigen prison. Corey and Betsy spent 10 months in three different prisons. The last was the infamous Ravensbrück concentration camp in Berlin, Germany. Betsy died. Of course, her father had died. But Corey survived. And the 10 Boons gave their lives to help the people of God, the Jewish people. Corey realized her life was a gift from God. She wrote her book. She shared her story. And her story is this. Christians are supposed to help people, even if they're Jews or Muslims or white or black or Asian or purple. Like, it just doesn't matter. The Ten Boom family reminds us that it's our job on this earth to help anyone that's hurting. But... That's what made me think about this because the sheep are standing there in front of Jesus and they're going, I don't understand why we're being allowed to be let in. And it dawned on me that maybe they were confused 
Because if Corey Ten Boom were sitting there, she would be confused too. Why? Because of this. In their mind, helping people wasn't an optional way of life. Helping people was a normal way of life as a follower of Jesus. So the sheep were just people that were like, well, of course we're going to help the Jews. Why would we not? Like they're in need. And so that's what, that's what I was thinking about the, the Ten Boom family. Now, here's what I was thinking about this set of verses. If you don't read these verses in context with an end time, with the Jewish people, with what's going on at that particular time, you could actually get the impression that you are saved by your good works. Because Jesus is like, oh, come on in, and you're coming in because you've been helping the poor and feeding the homeless and giving naked people clothes. But we know that's not true. And we know that's not true because the Bible in other places says that's not true. Look at Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift of God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done, so none of us can boast about it. So Paul says, it's not because of your good deeds that you get to go to heaven and spend eternity with, with God. Romans eleven six 6 says this, and since it's through God's kindness, then it's not by their good works, for in that case, God's grace would not be what it is, free and undeserved. See, if we were to take this parable today completely out of context, then you know what? It would seem like people are saved by their works. Which is why when you and I read the Bible, the context of where we read it and what it's saying is so incredibly important. Now, should we do what Jesus is commending these people for doing, helping the homeless and feeding those? And absolutely. It was so important for Jesus, for this group of people at that time. It should be important for us now. But in context, in context, this is about a group of people that helped the Jewish nation while they were in this tribulation time. So my final word on this parable series, and this parable today is this. When you read your Bible, or when you hear a sermon, you need to make absolute sure that what you are hearing and what you are reading is in context with the whole story. And the reason why I say this today is because so many false religions and false teaching comes from people taking verses out of, out of context in the scriptures. This is why we came out with this. We, we, Rob and I wrote these, these, we came out with these footsteps Bible reading journals. Now, if you don't have one, you can go on online to uh, womensbiblestudy.com and go to our bookstore. Uh, you can get them on there. They're pink or they're brown. We also have more coming in that are darker pink ones, so we should have those in, soon too. But the reason why I tell you this is because it's a Bible reading plan, plan that takes you through the whole Bible. And we do it not set up in days so that you can, you, you know, you don't have to make it through a day. It's not set up on Monday, Tuesday, none of that. You do it on your own time. And we did it for the specific purpose of you being able to take your time and read the Bible. So if you open it up and you're reading like, uh, Mark 9.30, and you're like, I don't even understand what that means. You stop and you study it. But you study it in context of what it's saying, not, not allowing someone just to pull out a verse and say whatever they want. Take it and study it. Search the scriptures for yourself. That's what the, the main point to what I'm saying in all of these parables and any Bible study that we do. Search the scriptures for yourself to make sure what is being said is really true. I was listening to a pastor the other day. I have probably three pastors that are like go-to people. To me, they are very biblical. They are very smart. What they, they do this. They take things in context, except one that I heard last week. He's one of my favorites. I, he's, he's one of my go-to guys, and he's doing something in Genesis, and he uses something in Genesis to promote his pre-tribulation theory, which I absolutely disagree with, and he took it out of context, but anyone listening to him would just be like, well, he's smart and he said it, so I believe it. Don't do that. Please, please, I'm begging you to not do that. Here's why. We have to know the Bible for ourselves so we can spot error. And that is how we're gonna end our entire parable series. And we're done. 
And so what we're going to do is we're going to watch the balance of our uh, blooper video from Israel, and then we'll end really quick. To show you, the land that we're standing on right now belongs to the tribe of... Oh, crap. <laughs> so this is going to be where we do all the bloopers. I think I missed... Good morning. Welcome to Israel as we are continuing our study in the life of... Um... Okay. It's okay. Go for it. We'll try it again. Ready? Just go. For go. Okay. Jonah did something um, that Jesus. Uh, stop, sorry. Okay. Um, it's because of Jonah. Talk about this in class as we're standing here in Masada at this most amazing site in southern Jer Israel. How's that? Jerusalem, Israel. Good morning. Welcome to Israel as we are continuing our study uh, called Life Changing Stories The Parables of Jesus. And um, what we're. we're I'm sorry, I just can't get this one together. Life change, you know why I always get messed up is that life changing stories, parables. I always like throws me for a loop. So we're gonna try this all over again and we're gonna hallelujah it all over again, okay? Hallelujah. Okay. So we're going a whole different direction and we're gonna talk about two sons. So Abraham has Isaac, Isaac has two sons. Uh, yay, How, well we've stopped him. Okay, so today we're gonna talk about two brothers. So that is where we're gonna be going in class today as you are stand, Okay. Hallelujah. Good morning. Welcome to our, I don't know. We're, we're, I'm not even sure what we're welcoming you to because I'm kind of tired of what, I'm just done. Do you get it? <laughs> okay, let's try it again. Sorry. Hallelujah. Woo! Okay. <laughs> so glad you joined us. Thank you, Paula, Eric, Rob, and John. So excited to have them here. So, um, hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> we were really excited to get out of there. Uh, but thank you to those of you that are here, that they're, they're watching us, not here, because no one's here but me, but that, that have made it through this entire series. I know for me, I have learned so much. I learned about the kingdom of God. I'd never studied it before. And I grew my faith so much because of being able to do this parable series. Um, next week, make sure you start watching our Exciting End Times conference. We'll have new content. Uh, for those of you that normally donate each week, if we can ask you to please keep doing that through the summer. When we do webinars, when we have things like that, we still have all of our bills to pay during the summer. We always say this, Rob and I don't take any money. Anything you donate goes to, to ministry. Um, the best thing you can do for us is set up an online donation, like a monthly donation that just comes out and then that way we know what we have coming in. And for those of you that just normally support us, I cannot even tell you how much we appreciate you. Uh, you're the reason why we can do the things that we do. So I just wanted to tell you that. And uh, so we'll be back in August. So we will see you with our, our brand new series in August um, called Been There, Done That. Father, thank you so much for this series and what we've learned. I pray that as we walk away today, that we will have learned something new. I pray that each one of us will start taking a, a different view of how we read the Bible and making sure that we read it in context so we know exactly what you want us to know. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the kingdom of God. Thank you for the parables. Thank you that you are coming back and you will return and reign on this earth. And for that, we are so excited. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. See you soon.